Hello and welcome to Study IQ. I am your friend Rahul Sai Gaonkar. I hope you are all in good spirits and your preparation is going as per schedule. Today we'll continue our discussion of modern Indian history. I hope you remember that we were discussing consolidation of the British rule in India. Today will be the part four. Now before this, we have understood how the British conquered Bengal, then Mysore, then the uh, Maratha Confederacy, how it was broken. Today we'll focus on how the British conquered the northwestern part of Indian subcontinent. And here we'll focus about two important regions. One is Punjab, how the British conquered Punjab, and how the British conquered the Sindh region. Both these regions would be discussed simultaneously. Because we need to understand how British divided the powers. We know wherever the British went, they divided Indian powers. Let's talk about Mysore. How they conquered Mysore? See, against Mysore, they pitted Nizams. They pitted Marathas against the Mysore. Many times they broke the loyalties. They broke the allegiances. They created dissensions and divided the Indian powers. A very similar thing was done here with respect to Punjab and Sindh also. So today we'll discuss about how the British conquered the northwestern region. What were the prime factors which made them capture these? Of course, money is a very important factor, right? They love money. They were traders. They wanted commercial benefit. But apart from that, what were the other factors which led to the conquest of northwestern Indian subcontinent? That would be the agenda in today's discussion. Let's begin our discussion. To get all that information, be with me on Study IQ. And if you are preparing for the exams, UPSC Civil Service or State PSC, just visit StudyIQ.com. You can also download our app from Google Play Store where you will get all the information. And do know that today is Women's Day. And first of all, my heartiest wishes to all the women watching this. Happy Women's Day to all of you. And just for today, there is a big offer running on Study IQ. If you use the code Rahul33, you will get. 33% discount on any course on Study IQ plus you'll get double validity also. Means if a course is for 1000 rupees, first of all, you'll get it only for 666. And if it is valid for one year today, if you buy it, you'll get you'll have the validity for two years. And you do know that we have launched a program recently, Fundamentals of Stock Market Investing. The code is also applicable on this particular course. Do avail this discount today. Right, let's begin our discussion. Let me just give you a small recap. Now, this is a small tradition that I follow so that you come on the same page as I am here, so that you understand thoroughly. Now, we know the British came as traders. They set up the trading post, and I told you, they set up at three centers, Calcutta, Madras, and Bombay. More than two dozen factories were set up, predominantly around these three regions, and slowly and steadily, they started to capture area after area. Now, we know in our previous interaction, we have spoken about how the British conquered Bengal and Bihar. First, Bengal and Bihar. Very prosperous regions. It gave them money to conquer other areas later on. Then, they shifted their attention towards Mysore, which was very closer to the Madras province. Calcutta, already became a very important province. The governor general of Bengal was the governor general of India later on, right? Then they started to develop the Madras province. Then they slowly moved towards Surat, Bombay. Bombay became a very important center. So first they annihilated the Mysore, Mysore uh, dynasty under Hyder Ali and uh, Tipu Sultan. We know that. Nizam was already a partner. He had signed subsidiary lines. Later on, the Maratha confederacy was broken. The Holkers, the Sindhyas, the Bosleys, the Peshwas, everybody was defeated one by one. Yes, they were allowed to rule. You can see here Indore, Bhopal, Gwalior. They were allowed to have their own small princely states, but they were supposed to sign the subsidiary alliance. The same was the case with Rajputs also. Rajputs are also signed subsidiary alliances. Now, when they conquered Bombay, they went to this Gujarat coast. Now, they were looking at two important areas. One were the Sikhs and the other one was the Sindh. Now, please remember why till now or why the northwestern region was last to be conquered because there was a big Maratha ruler, Maratha confederacy, which was there between the British and the other parts of subcontinent because Maratha were like a barrier. Now, once the Maratha confederacy was broken, then these people became immediate neighbors. And now the British had their eyes on the northwestern side. So we'll understand how exactly they conquered the northwestern side here, right? 
let's let's try to understand the means i told you they use three means policy of ring fence which i explained earlier policy of ring fence means first create a buffer region around the british territories now this was further extended into subsidiary alliance of uh, lord wellesley now lord wellesley created subsidiary alliance where the princely states were to have the british troops in their location there would be a resident in the court also later on the doctrine of lapse in fact the next part part 5 very soon tomorrow dear for tomorrow whenever we discuss that we will have uh, we'll have a thorough understanding of all these three policies or the means through which the british consolidated and of course the threats were these and today's threat predominantly are the russians because marathas they annihilated the maratha confederacy was broken afghans are also a threat we'll understand but the big threat was uh, the russians the russophobia because of which the british conquered the north western part french more or less they were relegated they tried to come back again because napoleon is a part and parcel of this discussion so the french the russians the afghans they were a threat and because of this they started to create another buffer between uh, the russians and the indian subcontinent which they had already acquired so let's try to understand what exactly happened the first thing that we need to know a, a macro view that we need to have is why the british looked towards sindh and punjab of course there were commercial reasons because i told you the british were traders the british looked for money so they wanted more and more territory they wanted uh, they were they were greedy right they tried to explain themselves why we are conquering this the, the concept of white man's burden we spoke about that but ultimately it was all about economics it was all about money so commercial interests were there if you look at the region if you look at uh, this particular region here towards the sind towards punjab again punjab had fertile plains the the uh, the indus plains the gangetic plains also the sind region was very attractive from the coastal perspective from the maritime trade perspective so they looked towards these regions from commercial perspective for sure but there were also geo strategic and some practical reasons because of which they they moved towards these regions now first of all what were the practical reasons see the maratha confederacy was broken once the maratha rule was broken the barrier between the british rule and the north western india was broken that means the british and the north north western forces were now immediate neighbors and whenever there are neighbors there are bound to be disagreements huh? they say you cannot change your neighbors you can change you change your friends you can you cannot change your neighbors so neighbors are there so there would be some disagreements apart from that there was some geo strategic reasons now here you need to understand a very important development that was taking place throughout the world in europe there was a threat of napoleon bonaparte napoleon bonaparte one he was expanding his domain you can see here napoleon's empire in 1812 it was expanding it expanded towards entire europe so he had conquered the continental europe and he was now threatening the uk he was now threatening the swedish empire also so it was napoleon's rule all over europe now a very important development happened in 1807 in 1807 treaties of tilsit were signed between napoleon and alexander one of russia now on one side if you look at russian expansion and please focus here on the yellow diagram here from 1796 to 17 sorry 1947 these are the areas now they expire towards the north and east which are not relevant for us but movement towards this side is very very relevant for us especially in the indian subcontinent now through the treaties of tilsit napoleon and alexander had an understanding napoleon basically cemented his place in the european side so this was basically napoleon's domain now this was the domain of the tsar of russia that is alexander 1 and he was not supposed that means alexander was not supposed to interfere towards napoleon side and napoleon was not supposed to interfere towards the other side and in the meantime russia was made an ally prussia the german side was also made an ally with napoleon so the english were now on defensive they now thought that yes napoleon was a threat napoleon wanted to come from the maritime route towards india towards the western coast but with the fall of mysore empire that ambition did fall because he was embroiled in the politics of europe but there was a big big threat now from the russian tsar who was moving towards the mainland asia who was moving towards afghanistan and then probably towards india 
so this was a big threat that the british anticipated and this threat was further i would say exaggerated by lord aclet who came to india in 1836 he was made the governor general of india in 1836 he uh, he was uh, very much focused on the russian expansion so to a large extent russophobia or the fear of russians reaching towards the indian side were quite real because of which the british started their aggression or their expansion towards the north western frontiers so this is this is the basic idea that you need to have why they look towards the north western region of course for commercial reasons for the fall of marathas and geo strategic reasons because internationally some developments were happening now let's try to understand what was the situation in these regions first of all in sin so we'll talk about sin in 1820s and 1830s what happened here see during the 18th century the sindh area was ruled by kalora chiefs right kalora dynasty but after this the kalora dynasty was defeated by the talpura emirs now talpuras were basically a balochi tribe who were under the military service of the kalora chief themselves but slowly and steadily the talpura emirs or the talpura chiefs they gained power but even before the talpura chiefs or talpura emirs got power the kalora chiefs had granted a farman or there they called it as parwana where the british were allowed to set up their factories the british set up a factory in thatta now this was allowed by the prince gulam shah in fact gulam shah gave exclusive rights to british and he did not allow other european powers from trading here so one thing you need to understand that in sindh the british already had a presence from the trade perspective which was allowed by the kalora dynasty itself but in 1770s a baloch tribe talpuras they descended from the hills and they settled in the plains and they were already under the service of kaloras they were excellent soldiers they were military very adept soon they acquired great influence and ultimately usurped the power by defeating the kalora chiefs the, one of the talpura leader was mir fata ali khan who set up his complete control over sindh and please remember whenever i talk about sindh uh i'll show you the map in some time now if you imagine this to be gujarat the neighbor to gujarat was sindh and if you go move towards the uh, north western side you will find afghanistan so afghanistan and sindh predominantly were very tribal regions and in sindh when i talk about these talpuras even now these talpuras in the sindh region today what we call balochistan in pakistan as of today the balochi tribe these were predominantly shias they followed the shia culture so you can see here the religious divide between afghanistan and the sindh region the balochi tribes so in this region there were constant tussle between the tribes please remember this afghanistan was never united under one particular domain because there are so many tribes that you find you find balochis you find kazakhs you find you find kirgs you find so many tribes and in sindh you find balochi tribes so there were tribal wars going on and when i talk about these emirs there were different emirs or different chiefs in different areas so th this is the background that you need to have right so when i say it was ruled by talpura emirs there were there were talpura talpura brothers first of all different brothers ruled different areas towards the sindh region and uh, this entire region was more or less fragmented I, i hope you get the picture so sindh was ruled by the talpura emirs similarly what was there in punjab at the end of this discussion in in just 5 to 10 minutes i'll show you the pictures you you'll get a you'll get a clear idea of what is happening right so in punjab in 1820s and 30s slowly and steadily six rallied under maharaja ranjit singh the six were never behind a monarch please remember the six were a warrior clan and they became a warrior clan from the times of guru gobind singh the 10th guru the last guru of six and we know that they they uh, united themselves under the khalsa because guru gobind singh's predecessor guru tegh bahadur was assassinated he was killed by aurangzeb we know that after that guru gobind singh came he set up the khalsa and from that time they have been in constant a quarrel with the mughals and now in the 18th century slowly and steadily the mughals were declining and the sikhs started to gain more and more control towards the north western or i would say towards the northern region now what was happening with the sikh khalsa the sikh khalsa was not united per se the sikhs were basically united through something called as missiles now these missiles are like different families the missiles were egalitarian military administrative sikh units 
under different jatedars. So you can call it as jatas. There were 12 jatas or 12 missiles of Sikhs. They were quite expert in the guerrilla warfare. They had fought continuously with the Mughals. They had also fought continuously with the Afghans in the 18th century. And now in the 19th century, they were now exposed to the British because the Marathas were over. The Maratha barrier had gone. So British and Sikhs, they became neighbors. It is said that there were 12 Sikh missiles or Sikh jatas. 12 missiles, they congregated yearly at the Harmandar Sahib in Amritsar twice a year. It was called as Sarbat Khalsa. So whenever the 12 missiles used to meet, 12 missiles or 12 families or 12 jatas, they used to meet every year at Harmandar Sahib. We know that in Amritsar. It's called Sarbat Khalsa. Once on Diwali and once on Holi. Right. So together they comprise something called as Dal Khalsa. So whenever I talk about Sikhs, so Sikhs were like a family, a loose family. I wouldn't call it a confederate clearly or a confederation similar to Marathas, but they were rather stronger than Marathas. They were, they were connected uh, through religion. They were connected through Sikhism. So 12 missile formed together the Dal Khalsa. All right? This was the Sikh army. Thousands of trained Sikhs who were well versed with the art of fighting because they were a warrior clan. So this was the condition. But in 1820s and 1830s, they rallied behind one individual. One individual from Sukher Chakya Missile. Sukher Chakya Missile's chief was Mahan Singh. His son was Maharaja Ranjit Singh. It is said that Maharaja Ranjit Singh was one of the greatest Sikh, Sikh kings who united, who united all the Sikhs under a, a, a name, a Sikh kingdom. Right? He was basically the architect of Sikh kingdom. Now, during Ranjit Singh's reign, the Sikhs were temporarily united under one kingdom and they expanded their domain a lot. Now, it is said that Maharaja Ranjit Singh was very young. He was just 12 years old when his father died. But since 1820, everybody knew that he was the, the king of this Sikh kingdom. He was a very far-sighted diplomat. He understood the implications. He was a very good warrior. So he rallied people behind him. He avoided the mercenaries. He, he knew that English mercenaries could not be trusted. So he did not keep mercenaries in his army. He kept only Sikh people in his army. He knew that English had defeated the Marathas. But after the fall of Marathas in 1818, the Marathas were completely annihilated. They were defeated. So now the Sikh kingdom and the British were neighbors. Now, if we look at the map, you will understand what is happening here. See, this is 1839. The Sikh Empire expanded from the northern side, entire Kashmir. Today's Kashmir was under the Sikh Empire. Amritsar was there. Lahore. Lahore was their capital city. Then there is Multan, present day Pakistan. They expanded till Peshawar. Now, earlier, whenever we talk about Sindh or the Afghani rulers, one of the one of the Afghani emirs was Dost Muhammad Khan. Now, his expand his reign in 1839. It expanded from the Sindh side. In the Sindh, there were the Talpur emirs. Dost Khan basically ruled over the entire region, even the Sindh region to a large extent, right? So on one side, there is Dost Muhammad Khan and the other emirs. On one side, there are Sikhs. And on the other side here, if you talk about these are the British. This was the British India. So everybody became a neighbor, one neighbor and the two neighbors. What British do best? The British do uh, this thing of divide and ruling. We know that the British started the concept of divide and rule. I told you, uh, Lord Auckland was the governor general in 1836. Now, he, he wanted to expand continuously. And Lord Auckland was quite obsessive about the threat from the Russian side. He had, a, he had a, an idea that Russians are going to move towards Afghanistan, then towards India. So he had to safeguard the British Empire. See, he wanted to counteract the influence of the Afghanis. Now, this threat was made real also. This threat was made real because those Muhammad Khan, he wanted to sign a treaty with British because he also wanted some sort of safety because he wanted the British army to quell a lot of rebellions in, in his own territory. I told you the Afghanistan territory was filled with tribal chiefs and those Muhammad Khan, he was looking for a treaty to be signed with British. But what he did, he played the British, he played the fear of Lord Auckland. Now, Dost Muhammad Khan, he invited one of Russian Tsar's diplomats 
towards his area in his court basically and this news spread in british india and the british were alarmed by this in fact this was a game plan of those mohammad khan where he invited a russian diplomat to his court by which the british were to sign a treaty with him this was something which was a, a game plan developed by those mohammad khan and what the british did were british slowly and steadily wanted to create a buffer state so they entered sindh region they took over the sindh region then they started to balance with the uh, punjab region also slowly and steadily they expanded towards afghanistan they attacked afghanistan also they annihilated kabul in 1839 so let's talk about what exactly happened how they how they started this divide and rule policy as i told you they were looking to counteract the influence of the russians they knew that ranjit singh was quite strong and till the time ranjit singh was there till 1839 the british knew ranjit singh could not be coerced now Ra maharaja ranjit singh also knew his weaknesses he he knew he had compulsions on one side they were the british on other side he had the afghanis to fight with so he knew his limitation he simply wanted to safeguard his own territory so what happened was continued aggression between afghanistan and uh, the sikhs was very well known and in in one of the uh, opportunities that the english got ranjit singh captured sindh rojan from the afghans now this gave an opportunity to the british now what the british did was they sent henry pottinger to hyderabad so please remember this this hyderabad is not the nizam hyderabad this is the hyderabad towards the sindh region to sign a treaty with the emirs of uh, sindh now what the british did the british sent henry pottinger to sign a new treaty in hyderabad now this hyderabad is not the nizam hyderabad this was the hyderabad from sindh region and i told you the talpura emirs different emirs ruled over different territories and again uh, i would say under the afghani dost mohammed himself now initially the emirs refused to sign a treaty with the british they, they did not entertain henry pottinger now please remember these emirs from the sindh they were talpura brothers they did not want the british presence in their territories but reluctantly they had to sign a treaty in 1838 when the british threatened with the possibility of supporting ranjit singh to attack the emirs themselves so after they signed the treaty which was basically i can say it, it was basically a subsidiary alliance itself the british were now able to send their uh, send their troops send their people send their resident wherever they wanted in the sindh region it, they also got a permission to intervene in the disputes between the emirs and the sikhs on one side now they made a subsidiary alliance with the talpura emirs of sindh and on the other side they also got ranjit singh to sign a tripartite agreement with the english that means see the british are now here and they signed a tripartite agreement with the punjab people they also got sindh people on board in fact sindh people they had they had a subsidiary alliance so they could station their troops here and the afghani ruler dost khan was here who was allegedly conspiring with the russians because he had invited a russian diplomat right so this was a situation means the british somehow got an upper hand in sindh till now they did not fight with punjab it was more or less a status quo with punjab but what happened why why the afghan war started why the british started to expand towards the afghanistan side as i told you in 1938 itself there was a tripartite agreement so the officers from bombay province they started to survey the coast of sindh and they knew the commercial and the strategic importance of this particular region in fact what they did was they slowly and steadily started expansion in other regions of sindh they annexed karachi the principal port of sindh and subjugated the sindh emirs they got a lot of concessions from the sindhi emirs they got concession of free trade they got concession of relaxation of duties and tolls they also uh, they also went for abolition of oppressive laws all these things were done basically the sindhi rulers were subjugated so the british initially it started to expand from karachi towards afghanistan so by 1938 they started their advance towards afghanistan now they got an opportunity here why because there was some sort of a dispute going on between emir dost mohammed khan and the former emir shah shuja durrani so the british sided now with durrani and dost mohammed khan he ran away he fled his territory and the british put shah shuja durrani in kabul in fact shuja was also forced to sign a subsidiary 
alliance. So what happened with the British? The British were here. They gained Sindh. They went till Kabul. They captured Kabul also. On one side, they had a treaty with Punjab also were silent. So they, signed, they even signed a subsidiary alliance with Kabul. Now we know the Afghanis, they were, they were basically disunited tribal chiefs who, who joined. I told you they, they were Balochis, uh, they, were, they were Balaks, they were Kirigs, right? So many tribal people, Afghani Pashtuns. So they never liked foreign occupations. So the British, once they captured Kabul, they stationed some troops there and majority of forces came back. But very soon rebellions outbroke there in Kabul. It was quite tough for the British to hold on to it. So in, 19, in 1842, the Afghanis rose against the British. The Afghanis united and they rose against the British and they drove British out of Kabul. Now it is said that a British force of 10,000 was there and only one out of it survived because of extreme cold. Now by this time, the British were not going to accept any kind of defeat. We know that, right? Wherever we have seen uh, Anglo-Mysore war, Anglo-Maratha war, whenever the British are defeated, they used to retaliate with much bigger force because they knew they are a bigger party here. They did the same thing here also in the first Anglo-Afghan war. Now what happened? In 1842, Lord Ellenborough replaced Lord Auckland as Governor General of India. And this time, Lord El Ellenborough wanted to take revenge he wanted to take revenge from the Afghanis. Afghanis were disunited. They had Sindh in their hands. They had, they had Kabul in their hands. But the people had retaliated. So the British sent a bigger force. Now they had a big resolve that we are going to capture the entire Sindh region, the entire Afghanistan region. So what they did, they sent a bigger force. And this time they called a, a very experienced general, General Charles Napier. In 1842, at the age of 60, Charles Napier was very experienced in wars in European side also. So he was made major general. And under the policies of Ellenborough, Charles Napier was given a mandate basically to stop the rebellions. He was given the mandate to quell the rebellions. Right? So simply quell the insurrection of the Muslim rulers in the Afghan side. But what Charles Napier did, Charles Napier campaign against the different chieftains, it, it basically resulted in victories, victories in Battle of Maini, victories in Battle of Hyderabad, ultimately subjugation of Sindh. British did not expect this. The British sent Charles Napier purely for quelling the rebellion because the British already had the forces there. But this time, he decimated the Sindh rulers. He decimated whatever Sindh chieftain were there. The other uh, rulers were also decimated. And eventually, Sindh was completely captured. And by this time, Dost Muhammad Khan, right? We know Dost Muhammad Khan, Emir, he, he ran away towards the bulk before. He again came for fighting. The British defeated him. They, they sent him in exile in the British India. Later on, they brought him back. Later on, Dost Muhammad Khan was brought back and uh, he continued his rule from 1843 to 1863 under British tutelage. In fact, Charles Napier was governor of Sindh for a very long time till 1847. So this basically completed the subjugation of the Sindh region and many parts of Afghanistan region also. So towards the northwestern region, Sindh was captured. In fact, Sindh was later on made a specific province in 1936 and it ultimately became a province of Pakistan. So the British captured the Sindh region, a very fertile region in the Indus Plains. Later on, they also got a lot of uh, coastal or maritime territory with Sindh. Then, what was happening with the Punjabis? See, in Punjab, after the defeat of Maratha Confederacy, the company and the Sikh state, they became neighbors. And their relations were governed by Treaty of Amritsar. Why? Because there was Maharaja Ranjit Singh. Now, Maharaja Ranjit Singh, till he was there, till 1839, the British did not go for any sort of expedition against the Sikhs. They had a treaty of Amritsar where there was a boundary between the British state and the Punjabi state. And what was the boundary? It was the Satlaj River. Now, if this is the Satlaj River, then the, the, the claim was that Ranjit Singh gave up all claims over the Sis Satlaj region. Means towards this side, towards the Indian side, this was the British territory. And towards the other side, it was basically Ranjit Singh, right? So the Punjabi 
and the the Punjabi or the Sikh state and the British state were basically divided by River Satluj. So River Satluj was like a boundary, and the Treaty of Amritsar was honored by both the parties, by the British also and by the Sikhs also till 1839. But what happened in 1839? Maharaja Ranjit Singh expired. Now immediately after the expiration of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, there was conflict of succession in the Lahore Darbar. Now Lahore Darbar was a Sikh Darbar. Now this instability was the opportunity which British were looking for. Now in any case, the Sikhs never liked monarchy. Right? The Sikhs were uh, Sikhs never supported monarchy. They were different missiles, but they were more of an egalitarian setup where every missile had their own identification. So monarchy under Maharaja Ranjit Singh survived because of able leadership. But once he expired, then the collapse of Sikh empire was very very soon to come. The English started to intervene in the internal affairs of the Sikhs, and what followed was the first Anglo-Sikh war from 1845 to 46. Now what happened here? Maharaja Ranjit Singh's legitimate son and successor Kharak Singh was not very efficient. During a brief period of reign, there were a lot of court factions. Kharak Singh suddenly died in 1839. Now, after Kharak Singh, his son also Prince Naunihal Singh also died in a very anarchic situation. So, the eldest son Kharak Singh died. Kharak Singh's son also died. So. Another younger or a minor son of Ranjit Singh, Dalip Singh, became the king. But he was a minor, so the ultimate rule or the ultimate power was with the regent Rani Jindal and Hari Singh Dogra as wazir. Now, there were many factions who wanted to gain power. People were against Rani Jindal, they were conspiring against Rani Jindal. They were conspiring against Hira Singh Dogra. Hira Singh Dogra himself had ambitions of ruling over Kashmir. So, among all this confusion, the Anglo-Sikh Anglo -Sikh war started. The British simply wanted an opportunity. According to the British historians, the Anglo-Sikh war started because Sikh army crossed the river Satluj. Now, this was an aggressive maneuver which the British wanted and it justified the war. Again, this is the story that British historians tell, but many Indian historians tell that British wanted some sort of an opportunity to start a quarrel or to start a war. And this was the reason which was highlighted. And we know that after Ranjit Singh, the Sikhs were not united. Some Sikhs, they rallied behind different heads and they crossed River Satluj, which gave an opportunity to declare war. The war began now. The war began in 1845, around 20 to 30,000 troops from British side and 50,000 men from the Sikh empire who were under the, who were under the commander Lal Singh. But again, as I told you, the Sikhs were seldom united. There was treachery by Lal Singh, there was treachery by Teja Singh and this led to one defeat after another for the Sikhs. There were five successive defeats at Mudki, at Firosha, at Aliwal, at Sobra. Till, 19, till 1846, the Sikhs power was uh, reduced more and more. They were disunited and they couldn't fight. Eventually, Lahore fell in 1846 without a fight. And there was a Treaty of Lahore, which was quite humiliating. Now, according to the Treaty of Lahore, the Jalandhar Doab was eventually annexed by the British. The area of Jammu and Kashmir was sold to Raja Gulab Singh for 5 million rupees. And this was the beginning of the entire Jammu and Kashmir crisis. Why? Because Raja Gulab Singh was Hindu ruler. He was, he was sold the Jammu and Kashmir area for 5 million rupees. Gulab Singh and his Dogra successors, they eventually ruled the Muslim majority province Jammu and Kashmir till 1947. Now after 1947, we all know the story. This is how the Dogra rulers, they got Jammu and Kashmir. They bought it from the British. The Sikh army was reduced to 20,000 infantry and 12,000 cavalry only. In fact, after some time, another treaty of Bhairawal was signed in 1846 where the British acquired more and more powers. They removed Rani Jindal. And they had their own resident who was given more and more powers. Basically, it was like a subsidiary alliance for Punjab. The English victory and the capture of Lahore not only dealt a big, big blow to Sikh monarchy, it, it, uh, it reduced the status of Punjab. Punjab basically became a dependency of British. I told you it is more like a subsidiary alliance for the Punjabis or the Sikhs. 
Now, very soon, Second Anglo-Sikh War also began. Why? Because the Lahore Darbar, it came under the protection of English. Now, the English were looking for an opportunity to completely remove the Sikh Empire itself. And the opportunity was given by Diwan of Multan, who rose a, a, a revolt in 1848. Now, we know that the annexation of Punjab and uh, Sindh, they were with the commercial aspects, yes, but we need to look at British aspirations at other sides also. British were continuously expanding, not just in Sindh and Punjab, but towards China, towards Southeast Asia, because they were the advanced industrialist capitalist country. They were looking for colonies. They were looking for resources. They were looking for markets for their own place. And now they had the opportunity of again capturing a very resourceful, very affluent region called Punjab. On one side, they already had the the Bengali region, which was in the plains of, I would say, Ganga and Brahmaputra plains. And now they were looking to capture the plains of Indus, Indus River also. And the opportunity was given by the Diwan of Multan. Diwan of Multan or the governor of Multan was Mulraj. The British, they replaced him with a new person because, because of the issue of annual revenue. Now, this led to a revolt. Mulraj revolted and he murdered two of the English officers who are accompanying the new governor. Now, this gave an opportunity now for Lord Dalhousie. Lord Dalhousie was quite expansionist during 1848-49 itself. Lord Dalhousie, he became the governor general of India and he was very expansionist. He initially sent Sher Singh to suppress the revolt, but Sher Singh also changed his allegiances. Now, Sher Singh allied with Mulraj to fight against the British. No matter how united now the Sikhs were, the British had become a mighty force. Now, this is what has happened with each and every force in India. Now, they realize very late that the British are the ones who are devils and they have gone for a deal with the devil. Once they start to unite, it was very, very late. Now, the hardcore expansionist policies of British, they eventually uh, defeated the Sikh in the Second Anglo-Sikh War. And to avoid any such future rebellions, the British ultimately made Punjab as a province itself. Now, initially, Punjab and Sindh were one province. Sindh was made a separate province in 1936. So, a big, big area came under the power of British. Now, if you look at this particular diagram, you'll understand. Uh, let, let me just take you to the diagram here. Right, the initial diagram. See, now this entire region, it came under the control of British, the Punjabi region and the Sindh region a big, big region. By 1856, again, Lord Dalhousie was the uh, governor general at that time. So a huge area, very affluent area of Punjab was also now under the British. What was the significance of this? Now see, try to understand how it impacted. As I told you, the Sikhs were a warrior clan. They fought with the British. The British defeated them. So Sikhs had some sort of a respect towards the warrior who had defeated them. So Anglo-Sikh war, it gave two sides a mutual respect for each other's fighting prowess. And the Sikhs admired the British. Many Sikhs after the Anglo-Sikh war were inducted in the British army, where they fought very loyally on the British side. In fact, even today, the Sikhs are like the warrior clan itself. Now, there is a Sikh regiment in the Indian army. Also, Sikhs have been a very important warrior contributors towards India. So they fought alongside British to quell the revolt of 1857. In fact, in, in many other campaigns, in the Indian freedom struggle also, there were many Sikh soldiers in the British Indian Army. This was the big significance where uh, the Anglo-Sikh wars, they contributed to more and more soldiers in the British Indian Army. So this was the conquest of Punjab and Sindh. So the British acquired many areas. What happened here throughout the Part 1, 2, 3, 4, we have discussed first, Bengal was captured. And after Bengal, one by one, many states were defeated. First, the Mysore, then the Deccan, then the Western India, Punjab and Sindh finally came into hands of the East India Company. Although, many people fought against the British. The Marathas, the Mysore, the Sikhs, they fought for their independence from the company. But the British was superior. They were diplomatically superior. They were superior in many other aspects. They had huge resources of Bengal. The big problem was never the Maratha rulers were united. The Marathas and Sikhs were hopelessly divided. The Sikhs were 
I would say the Sikhs were united under Maharaja Ranjit Singh, very similar to how the Marathas were united under Baji Rao, Baji Rao Ballal and later on Balaji Baji Rao. But after those two Peshwas, the decline of Maratha started and eventually the British prevailed. None of the powers could combine effectively against the might of East India Company. So slowly and steadily, this was the story of conquest of India. Yes, of course, there were some rulers who were later on subjugated through the doctrine of lapse, which we'll talk in our next interaction. The, the neighbor of Bengal was Awadh, right? Awadh initially signed a subsidiary alliance, but later on, Awadh was one of the last states to be captured by doctrine of lapse on, on the uh, reasons of misgovernance, misadministration or maladministration. So we'll talk about that in our next interaction. But let me just finish off this discussion by talking about companies' success mantras. What were companies' success mantras? They had superior leadership. They had uh, superior military generals. They had unity of command, right? Their, their military was well disciplined. It was well played. It was disciplined. They had superior finances. They had Bengal wealth behind them. So eventually they prevailed and they set up the British rule in India. Now till here, I would say till 1857, it was the rule of East India Company. So we'll reach till 1857 because we're going to talk about revolt of 1857 in our subsequent discussions. So till 1857, it was the East India Company. Later on, the British crown, it took over the entire Indian colony. So it was because of the successes of East India Company who had good leadership, good generals, good commanders, good unity of command, better finances, they eventually prevailed over the disunited Indian rulers, not just in the mainland India, but towards the eastern India also and towards the northwestern India also. Now, the British were quite safe because they had Sindh, they had Punjab, they had Afghanistan, right? They had some areas of Afghanistan also with them as a buffer for, for protecting themselves from the Russians. But by this time, even the Russians did not remain a very big force. They stopped their expansion towards the Afghani region. And British were quite safe. The British conquest was complete. So in our subsequent discussions, we'll continue whatever we have built here, right? We have understood how the British step by step, bit by bit, they conquered India. But let me end my discussion with few questions for you, right? From Maine's perspective, right? First question with respect to Bengal from part one, consolidation of British rule part one. Critically examine the British conquest of Bengal with reference to the role played by the native Bengali elites. Now, please try to understand the question here asks about how the native Bengali elites played a big role in the conquest of Bengal. Now, a classic example here would be the Battle of Plassey, right? In the Battle of Plassey, we know Siraj Dola versus the British plus the Bengali elites. Many, many uh, businessmen like, like Jagat Sait, Rai Durla, many people played a big role in the conquest of Bengal. The next question, do you agree that Mysore was conquered primarily because of the role played by the Nizam and the Marathas during the second and third Anglo-Mysore wars? Yes, to some extent, again, you, you have to agree to some extent with this particular statement that Nizams and Marathas uh, did play a role in weakening the Mysore, but it was eventually the East India Company, right, or the British, which, uh, which prevailed. Even without the help, so help of Nizams and Marathas, eventually in, in the fourth Anglo-Mysore war when, the, when uh, Tipu Sultan was quite weak, right? Next question. The decentralization, a very interesting question. The decentralization of Maratha power between Maratha Sardars and Brahman Peshwa was a source of strength also and a source of weakness also. Try to discuss this critically. We know that the Marathas were not united. We know there were Maratha, different Maratha families, right? Peshwas were Brahmins and Maratha Sardas. They, they, they were Holkars, they were Sindhyas, they were Bosleys, right? They were Gayakwads. It was a confederacy. So, yes, it was a strength for them also. It was a weakness also. How? Try to answer this. Next question. Again, a general question about the contribution of exemplary leaders from British side. Lord Wellesley, General Arthur Wellesley, Sir Charles Napier or Lord Dalhousie, whoever it was, they were exemplary leaders of men. Discuss their contribution towards overall British conquests of India. The next question, to what extent Russophobia, that means fear of Russia expanding towards the Indian side, towards Sindh and northwestern side of India, 
how much was this a contributor towards British expansion in Sindh and in Punjab? Finally, a question here. Why did the Sikhs of Punjab fail to arrest the advance of company despite having formidable military prowess? Because when the uh, first Anglo-Sikh war started, the Sikh force was more than 50,000 soldiers. Why did they lose? What was the reason behind their loss? So try to answer these questions, try to attempt these questions. And uh, if you have any doubts, do post your doubts at doubts at the rate studyiq.com. You can send an email and uh, we will try to answer all uh, the questions. So this is the completion of consolidation of British rule. In the next segment of the part five, we'll talk about the policies of the British and then we'll jump towards 1857 revolt and the causes of it. So that would be the understanding in our subsequent classes. We'll move towards India's freedom struggle. So by now, I hope you have clearly understood how the British bit by bit conquered India. And with that note, let me end this discussion. Thank you for watching this. Jai Hind.